Ryan was the M1 of the PGY4 General Surgical Resident at uh, Harlem Hospital. Uh, so I'm presenting this uh, uh, paper we published uh, last year. Uh, it's uh, analysis of e-bike and e-scooter uh, injuries at uh, uh, our hospital. So we have been seeing uh, this uh, sort of injuries uh, lately, starting uh, 2020. So we wanted to uh, define the uh, patterns of these injuries. Um, and uh, reviewing the literatures, uh, the use of the uh, these uh, vehicles has been increasing in urban setting uh, all over the world. Uh, so the objective of this uh, study was to characterize the uh, uh, electric bike and scooter injuries and the outcomes uh, and uh, define the uh, socio-demographic uh, uh, and the characteristics of these uh, injuries. So this is a retrospective uh, review uh, of the trauma activations uh, in our ED. Um, and uh, we uh, uh, studied, we reviewed uh, 1979 uh, trauma activations that occurred uh, during 29 months of our study period, starting from uh, May of 2019 to the August of 2021. Uh, and then we saw 117 uh, e-bike uh, and e-scooter related injuries. And we excluded uh, the injuries where there was no uh, clear mechanism of injury, uh, moped, motorbike, bicycle, uh, skateboard, hoverboard related injuries. And we also didn't include uh, uh, pediatric age groups, uh, pregnant women and the prisoners. Uh, and uh, we analyzed uh, the sociodemographics of the, uh, the injuries, injury patterns, and the outcomes. So as we can see in this uh, bar graph, uh, majority of the uh, traumas occurred in uh, 18 to 40 age groups, uh, followed by 40, 41 to 60, and very few uh, above uh, 60. And most of those injuries occurred in uh, male about 90 percent days and in Harlem Hospital we uh, serve uh, mostly uh, the communities which are African-American and Hispanic so majority of those injuries occurred in the Hispanic followed by African-American uh, patients and uh, in regards to the vehicles specifically there were uh, 24 e-bikes and 88 uh, e-scooter uh, injuries and uh, 25% uh, of those uh, had helmet on, 36% uh, uh, were intoxicated. And the time of presentation in the ED, most of them uh, came in the evening. Uh, that was after uh, 4 p.m. to midnight, it was 62%. Uh, percentage, and most of them occurred in weekends, uh, in the uh, two weekend days as compared to the weekdays. And uh, the disposition of the patients, uh, where like 58 of them were discharged uh, from the ED uh, and uh, almost 42 were admitted and uh, 13 had to be admitted to the ICU. And mean uh, hospital stay was uh, 2.68 days uh, with the standard deviation of 6.4 and ranging from zero to 52 uh, days. And uh, the trauma activation in our hospital, uh, we do overhead calling for level one, level two, uh, and trauma consults are called uh, level three. So all the studies, uh, all the um, uh, injuries we included were and the overhead trauma activation, that those were level one, level two, and of them uh, about 95 were uh, level two activations and 5% uh, uh, were level one. And the uh, majority of the injury was uh, orthopedic related uh, extremity uh, injuries. That was 33.3, uh, followed by head and neck, uh, max facial, chest, and abdomen pelvis. Uh, focusing on the orthopedic injuries, uh, that was uh, 39, 10% uh, uh, was open fracture. Uh, and uh, uh, almost 90 percent days were closed fracture dislocation and sublocation and uh, uh, major two were lower extremity injuries there were 64 percent days uh, followed by upper extremity and one injury involved both upper and lower extremity and uh, 
uh, the operative intervention required was for 64% of the patients with those extramural injuries and uh, uh, 38% days uh, were managed conservatively. Mm, so we also did uh, um, multivariate analysis. Uh, the odds of uh, on the moderate to critical injury was uh, higher in the, with increasing A's uh, as compared to the mild injury. Uh, so 88 uh, patients had mild injury that was an uh, injury severity scale of uh, 0 to 8, followed by uh, non-mild injury, which occurred in uh, 29 uh, patients. And this uh, bar graph shows uh, uh, the trends uh, in 29 months of our study period, uh, the EVIC and e square injuries. Most of the injuries we can uh, see after uh, the covid Pre-COVID, there's no, not much injuries. Probably uh, the use of uh, those vehicles had not been that popular. And recently, the uh, use of those vehicles uh, has been increasing, uh, causing more um, injuries uh, that can be shown in this uh, picture. And uh, uh, when the review of the literatures, most of the findings were consistent with uh, prior studies. Uh, uh, one thing, male riders were much higher uh, percentage uh, in our study group. Uh, in other studies, it was mostly uh, around 60 to 80 percentage. And uh, head and neck injuries were comparable to other studies. Um, and most of these studies showed orthopedic injuries to be the most common. There were a few studies uh, which showed head and neck to be more common. Um, and uh, uh, almost most of these studies uh, reported there was uh, lower uh, chest and abdominal injuries, which was consistent uh, in our in the study. And uh, so uh, on conclusion, uh, the use of the electric vehicles, uh, including the Viking scooter, is expected to be increasing with uh, uh, people opting to go green using electric vehicles and using uh, these uh, electric scooters and e-bikes for short uh, transportation, um, short distance transportation in place of uh, gas vehicles. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> And then uh, we said uh, uh, there should be uh, mandatory uh, DW enforcement, mandatory helmet for training and education, uh, design, road design safety, speed control, and creation of special lanes uh, and no car zones um, uh, to, for the safety of the riders and pedestrians. So those are the references uh, for uh, my presentation. Any questions, comments? Uh, Emily, with your permission, I'm Professor Dr. Dilip Shah. If I can ask a question to Dr. Narayan. Yes, sir. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful presentation. You have done a good study about it. And you have shown the preventive aspects also to reduce the number of accidents. But you think these are being followed and how in your place the things are being controlled because if so many accidents are happening, do they do with the surveillance camera or uh, what is the method in which this kind of riders can be trained and uh, we can have prevention of these injuries? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, main part is the creation of special uh, uh, bike lanes, uh, which creates uh, more safety. Uh, they are trying to expand the bike lanes in regards to using uh, a uh, helmet, uh, there's, there has not been much reinforcement uh, in that regard. And even the law, it, it doesn't mandate uh, like uh, a mandatory uh, the law to uh, use the helmet. So they say it, uh, it's recommended to use the helmet, um, but uh, it also has noted for specific age groups below 16, uh, they mandate the use of helmets. And also uh, if they speed up the uh, vehicle is about 20 miles per hour, demanded the use of uh, helmet. 
so mm, I think the New York State uh, uh, is uh, uh, trying to encourage the use of uh, uh, these vehicles uh, to um, uh, for its benefits as a means of sort uh, distance transport as well. Uh, but uh, uh, in totality, I'm not. I don't uh, think uh, like uh, most of the safety measures uh, uh, has been uh, like regulated. Uh, that uh, more needs to be done on that regard. Thank you very much for your answer. But uh, as a kind of society or organization where you have done this study. You must uh, give to the traffic safety people this kind of data and inform them that you must implement uh, the rules properly. Then only the accidents will reduce. Right? Uh, yes. Good morning. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity. I'm going to talk about the balance in the valgus knee. And and review of the uh, literature available. So I don't have anything to explore. No disclosures. When considering the deformity of the valgus knees, there are bony factors affecting and soft tissue factors affecting. The bony factors are the main issue with the. No. This distortion of the distal femur and the lateral tibial fatu displacement and uh, distortion, hyperplasia and external rotation of the tibia. In addition to that, there are issues with the patella malalignment and lateral subluxation. In addition to the bony factors, there are soft tissue factors basically due to the tightness of the lateral soft tissue structures, especially the ITB band and uh, lateral collateral ligament and the contracted posterior lateral capsule and popliteus tendon, hamstring, and sometimes the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. And the main soft tissue factor affecting the disability is the medial ligament laxity. It depends on the severity of the bony factor and the duration of the deformity. And there are different classification uh, in uh, valgus knee. Earliest valgus knee classification uh, introduced in 1957 by the Kelgren and Lorenz system, but that is not directly related to the valgus knee classification. And the most practical and applicable classification in the, which is presented by the Ranavat in 2005. And uh, that is basically categorized the, into three categories, less than the 10 degrees and uh, 10 to 20 degrees deformity and more than 20 degrees. Newer classification came after that, especially Munaji and Shetty modified the runoff classification and so classification, but they are not much practically usable. Ranavath Munaji had added the modified the runoff classification by adding the extra articular deformities and increasing the grades to six grades. So the basis is uh, you have to plan the case, otherwise, you will be failed. Goal of the surgery are to eliminate the pain, correct the mechanical axis, increase the range of motion, and improve the function. So in the clinic, you have to assess the gait in the standing posture, and assess the spine, and assess the hips, and uh, the walking uh, assessment. At the same time, assess the knee in the range of motion, anterior posterior stability, and medial lateral stability of the knees. So in addition to that, we can perform the various valgus stress maneuvers and uh, main important thing, identify whether the MCA laxity incompetency is more than 30 degrees. And neuromuscular evaluation also very important in the lower limbs. In the radiological evaluation, weight bearing anterior, posterior and lateral views, skeletogram of the lower limbs are important, which assess the, from the hip to the ankle. And CT doesn't have much place, but, uh, place, but when there are case of extra-articular deformities, CT scan place, uh, have a place. Lateral view helps to identify the osteophytes and identify the bone uh, amount, that is the amount of bone uh, good quality stop. And uh, 
X-ray helps to identify the patella, whether it is subluxated or severe valgus deformity. And uh, depth of the resection had to be planned preoperatively. So at the end of the clinical assessment, you have to assess the deformity is correctable or fixed, and whether the knee is stable or unstable, and uh, assess the mobility in the anterior, posterior, and lateral views, and the coronal and sagittal deformities. You will are aware the normal knee is aligned with the femorotibial angle of 6 degrees to 7 degrees valgus. And the knee joint is not perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the lower limb, but it is internally rotated at 3 degrees. And you have to be thorough with the anterior superior iliac spine, the mechanical axis and the anatomical axis. It's better to do the templating uh, at the clinic. There are digital templates or manual templates. In the valgus knee, there is a debate going on whether to select cruciate retaining or uh, cruciate sacrificing uh, knees. And cruciate retaining knees, the important is that the implant survivability is small, but there are research that uh, show literature, so there are revision likelihood of revision is about 99.9%. And the case, other issue is the correct the defor de deformity correction also is difficult when the PCL is intact. In uh, cruciate sacrificing, that is uh, posterior stabilizing knee, is more stable with the post cam mechanism and allow greater lateralization of the compound into the patella tracheal. If proper soft tissue balance is restored, a minimal constraint compound can be used. There are some studies. James uh, McCauley had uh, done a study on this about the posterior stabilizing uh, uh, this the knee. Uh, posterior cushion retaining knee arthroplasty and uh, he had shown good results. But some of the studies, uh, Krako at all, White said, Berkey and Ajikos uh, studies have shown some deformities. Out of that, uh, White said studies uh, significant, he had done 135 cases and with the follow up of six years. And he recommend with the greater than 25 degrees deformity, posterior laxity, patella subluxation is not suitable. So implant selection, according to the Ranavath classification, the recommend is Ranavath 1 and 2 can do with the PS knees. And 2 and 3, the PS plus might need condylar constraint knees. So during the preoperative assessment, uh, just after the anesthesia, we had to again assess the patient tissue laxity and the deformity before we start cutting. The approach, medial approach or the lateral approach. The Kablish had explained the advantage of the anterior lateral approach and it gives the direct access to the soft tissue and it gives the chance of releasing the lateral tissue aspect. And... Uh, at the same time, on the approach itself, it opened the entire knee joint and it released the tissues in the Gerdes tubercle, ITB from the Gerdes tubercle. That's give a great help in stabilizing the and getting the deformity corrected. And sorry, and the Seki had told had um, done a multi center study and he mentioned that if there are more than 15 degrees deformity, the anterolateral approach is advantage in the than the medial parapetal approach. So a retrospective single center study on lateral or medial parapetal surgical approach. And uh, in this study, it had mentioned that in the lateral approach, the post of knee society score is better. Surgery time is uh, better and the angle of correction also better. But there are issues and the complications in the retrospective same study. It mentioned that uh, less peroneal nerve forces and there are problems with the wound healing. Main issue in the lateral approach is the wound healing issues. In the lateral approach, there are multi-center studies. They had mentioned that uh, these studies, the skin necrosis, transient peroneal nerve palsy, and skin breakdown and skin necrosis are the main issues with the complications. 
uh, systemic review on the approach, medial low lateral approach. And uh, Wong had mentioned the lateral approach was most useful and safer than medial approach in the treatment of severe uncorrectable valgus knee and deformity. But the surgeon has to be very thorough with the pathological anatomy. And uh, the, we have to anticipate the possibility of skin breakdown and uh, common periodontal nerve pulses. So I prefer anterolateral parapetal approach. So in our study, in a group of 52 valgus knee operated cases, anterolateral approach uh, we had done was 60.4. So we have to plan whether it's a mechanical alignment or kinematic alignment. And there are advantages. The mechanical alignment, the uh, goal of it is to align the rest of the normal mechanical axis. A systemic study with a kinematic alignment or mechanical alignment for knee arthroplasty. It said this study had concluded better clinical outcomes of obtaining kinematic alignment in total knee arthroplasty. But this study was not focused only to the valgus knee, sir. Valgus said, whereas both knees. In one of the meta analysis shows that uh, kinematic aligned total knee arthroplasty had a better outcome than the mechanical aligned total knee arthroplasty on WOMAC and combined knee society score and knee range of flexion and short term follow up. So, my I prefer is the combination of functional and mechanical element and it's I perform in navigational way. I manipulate, I correct the deformity by manipulating the bone resection, soft tissue release, so implant positioning. These are the sum of the extreme valgus cases we corrected with this uh, concept. In identify the correct valgus alignment is the most important. During the bone cut resection, we have to think about the lateral condyle hypoplasia and deformity. And uh, the most important guide is the lateral epicondyle lines are the most important guide where that we can take the reference according to the epicondyle lines and that give a better advantage and we have to make the minimal bone cuts in the lateral condyle resection and we have to we should not confine to the standards uh, cuts this we have to customize according to the uh, individual patient's requirement. So, the facts to consider on distal femoral cuts are the radiological valgus angle, collateral soft tissue status and balance, antiversion or retroversion of femur, patellar position. The tibial cut, as usual, it gives the 3 to 5 degree posterior slope, and the lateral tibial condyle resection should be minimal. And uh, you have to do minimal bone cut and consider the severe bone deformity in the lateral tibial plateau. Soft tissue release. Assessment of the soft tissue tension, both extension and flexion prior to the release, that's very important. And identify the soft tissue structures need to release, provide the maximum correction through the knee range of movement. And achieve, goal is to achieve a balance, soft tissue flexion and extension. So you have to target to achieve a rectangular extension and flexion gap after the soft tissue balancing. And uh, femoral component rotation, again, there are different controversies on this thing. The posterior condyle angle is a significant grade. That uh, angle is significantly greater in a valgus niche due to the lateral femoral condyle hypoplasia. So we have to consider that fact. So during the femoral component placement, we have to compare it with, as I am showing here, the green lines to get the balance with the tibial cut. So the goal is to achieve the balance uh, rectangular flexion and extension gap after the both tibia and femoral cut and soft tissue release. There is concept of flexion extension axis and in code we have to release the soft tissue according to this concept that in structures inserted near the flexion extension axis affect the both extension and flexion of the knees. That is the lateral collateral ligament and popliteal tendon. And structures which are attaching distal to the knee, the, those are only acting on only in extension. The fascia lata, 
posterior articular, articular capsule, bicep, and external gastrocnemic muscles. In the literature, there are different sequences as suggested by the different people. And uh, what is there in the doubt? What is the more appropriate sequence and appropriate technique, whether it's inside doubt or outside in? So my preference is uh, small continuous steps of improvement to achieve significant results. Minimally exposure on the medial side, removal of the posterior osteophytes along the posterior lateral condyle, posterior lateral release of the joint capsule along the margin of the tibial plateau, PCL and the IT band. And I release the posterior joint capsule. I don't cut uh, the popliteus, LCL or IT band. I just do by crusting if it is required. So we have to decide which structure we have to be released according to the patient's requirement during the surgery. And trial assessment is important. With the trial, we can see what structures are to be further released. Then there's an issue comes if it is not balanced, what to do? There are different protocols on uh, this thing. The patella, to stabilize the patella, to prevent uh, subluxation post-operative, we have to better release lateral retinacular release because that, uh, in the especially the valgus knees, the lateral structures are contracted. If there are residual valgus deformity, the reasons are there are it can be asymmetric instability or symmetric instability. Asymmetric instability is due to the inadequate release of the tight ligament. Symmetric instability is due to the extension gap is larger than the flexion gap. That is due to the excessive bone cut. So we have to select larger implants. There can be flexion instability. That is again due to the insufficient bone cut from the distal femur. And lateral instability inflection yeah, can be managed with the soft tissue release. The lateral, in our cases, lateral retinacular release is necessary for almost uh, most of the valgus knees. It's about 62 to 100 percent. External rotation of femur well, component is about 3 to 6 degrees. And we had post-operative complications, tibiofemoral instability, residual valgus deformity, restricted range of motion, wound days and serous fluid leakage from the surgical scar, perineal nerve palsy. These are the some of the complications we had. We were managed to come out without much complications. Roughly the wound complications about 6.97% develop uh, from the old patients. Serious fluid leak from the surgical scar is about 3%. Perineal nerve palsy, the stretching of the perineal nerve is unavoidable and some degree of post-operative ischemia. And it's about 3% of the, the literature shows that roughly average, it can be 3%. In our case, it's about 3.48%. The take-home message is pre-operative planning and implant selection with option. Focus on lateral femoral and tibial condyle hyperplasia and distortion. Minimal bone cuts, step-by-step soft tissue release. Appropriate implant selection. Appropriate police insert selection. Careful handling of the soft tissue and closure. Right, thank you. SHO working in uh, trauma and orthopedic department in Royal Devon University NHS um, uh, UK. So um, basically, it's it's a quick presentation about uh, ankle fracture and the possible post-op complications. It's a clinical audit, um, a complete cycle clinical audit that was conducted in um, uh, in our hospital uh, uh, in order basically to. Uh, identify any possible complications and if there is any change that we can implement locally and possibly we can um, uh, later on present it um, 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 on a national level. So, um, sorry. So, uh, quickly, basically, um, ankle fracture is one of the uh, most common uh, fracture presented today. Any, um, um, uh, it can, it can, uh, 
range with a wide variety of presentation. Um, um, that's why early recognition and interventions are crucial. And um, most of the fractures basically, um, as you know, as you know, um, is treated, uh, it depends on the type of fracture, but usually it's treated as an conservatively with casting and, and uh, painkillers, but uh, can proceed most of the time uh, with um, a surgical fixation, uh, uh, especially if there is uh, any ankle instability um, presence of any syndosmotic injury and depends on the uh, patient activity demand. So as I've said, um, uh, it's one of the most common complications, uh, or, or most common fractures presented to the uh, any. Usually it's diagnosed with, with uh, uh, basically um, um, an examination and an imaging and treatment can be operative or non-operative. Um, um, most of the fractures, actually, it could be an isolated malleolus fracture, which is 70%. It can be medial or lateral malleolus fracture, but it can present as a bimalleolar or trimalleolar fracture um, 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 in certain presentation. So uh, basically, our aim and objectives of, of our um, audit is, is to identify what are the uh, common complications uh, that are associated with patients that are going any uh, surgical fixation and uh, to recognize what are the accepted rates. So obviously all uh, surgical fixations would carry a risk of, of complication, but what are the accepted risk of, of developing, uh, developing a complication and whether those complications are associated with the risk factors so we can address those risk factors uh, in order to minimize those risks of, of complications. Um, so our methodology is basically, um, um, we, we uh, collect um, data for a whole year um, uh, from um, in 2021 um, and was retrospective and we've um, 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 uh, made a comparison against the uh, British Association guidelines. Uh, the data was obtained from our notes and emission locally and from the uh, uh, April letters as well, um, uh, which is um, uh, local follow-up letters uh, uh, with the patients that underwent surgical fixation. Um, so we have a, a total of uh, 54 patients over uh, 12 months in 2012 uh, in 2021. And the age was between 11 and 100 with, it, with, with uh, a mean age of 51 to 60. Um, um, uh, the risk factors usually uh, uh, that were presented is, uh, can be diabetic, which is uh, presented as 9% out of, of our total patients. Smokers, uh, which is 14 out of 54 is 25%, 25 25.9. And... Um, um, alcohol intake is considered a risk factor, unfortunately. Um, um, 11 out of 54 is 20.3%. 20, uh, 20, uh, um, the type of fractures that associated um, with, uh, or with uh, from the data collected, uh, the most common is bimalleolar fracture. Um, let me go uh, coarser. So, uh, the most common type of fracture is bimalleolar and trimalleolar fracture. Um, um, uh, out of these, uh, 14 were dislocated, um, 24 were associated with Taylor shift, which is which is usually uh, uh, presented with the fractures, and the fracture can present with with the Taylor shift. Um, and 60, 16, uh, 16 patients were presented with normal motors without any Taylor shift or. Um, uh, uh, without any uh, joint instability. So, uh, so the, the the most common uh, again, uh, it's not a large number that we were talking about, but it can, it can give us an idea about how we can work on later uh, based on the risk factors. So, the most common um, uh, complication here is is obviously uh, the uh, infection. Um, uh, so the infections, uh, post-operative, whether it was uh, a wound infection or a deep, deep infection involving the metal, 
um, uh, but out of the uh, 54 interest in out of 54 patients, uh, we have to um, uh, to do an operation for removal of metal work um, uh, only on one case. Uh, the other complications, um, uh, the uh, joint stiffness, uh, also the pain, um, um, those are the significant uh, complications, but other, other than that uh, is the delayed wound healing. Uh, and again, the numbness, um, uh, we had only one patient with numbness at the fourth term. So usually here in this slide, we uh, from our data, we can see that the uh, the uh, the significant age group in relation to the complication um, um, is in elderly, obviously, because usually in elderly we have they, they 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 have a, a multiple risk factors, whether they're diabetic, um, um, uh, or their immunity is compromised. Um, um, uh, so the most significant or the significant age group is between 61 to 70. Um, and, and the next of that is between 51 and 60. So uh, uh, age is, is, um, is an, an, an uh, uh, non-modifiable risk factor that we have to consider a uh, patient present with, um, um, uh, with an ankle fracture so we can um, um, intervene early in order to um, prevent any uh, possible complications. Um, uh, so again, here uh, this slide, which uh, the um, the top fractures overall, um, uh, and the complicated usually the complications uh, from our data um, uh, again is the bimalleolar and time a trimalleolar fracture. So type of fracture would would uh, basically um, uh, be in the decision making whether to intervene immediately or whether to delay. Um, um, patients or to defer patients for, for a few days until the swelling has subsided. So, um, but this would, um, uh, should be, um, 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 be in the decision-making whether to intervene early, um, uh, which is the top fracture. Um, um, and the total infected we can see here is, again, um, it's significant, although it's, it's, um, uh, small numbers, but significant as bimalleolar and trimalleolar are usually associated with soft tissue injury, uh, more significant than, and in that age group, in other age group, uh, we don't we don't we don't see them as present with high energy falls. So they present with a simple falls because of the um, um, of the medical background. Uh, those patients would be, would would have would be having significant um, medical history and. Um, especially osteoporosis, diabetic, if they're smoker. So that would increase the risk of, of having um, um, a post op complications if they needed one. Um, so uh, this slide, uh, uh, which are the dislocated uh, uh, Taylor Shift uh, Association. So, so we, can, we can see here that the non dislocated. Basically, more, uh, most of the cases are non-dislocated, but here we can we can see that the complications we had seven cases of dislocated that had um, complications and four cases um, um, out of the dislocated um, um, uh, are are affected. So um, it, it, it's a significant risk factor that we should consider, um, especially if. Uh, it's a matter of time, actually. That's why I mentioned that in this slide, um, uh, because uh, I will show you in the next slide, uh, if presented with a dislocated fracture, it should be reduced as early as possible. Um, um, uh, because again, um, uh, it's seen with higher risk uh, of developing complication. And uh, in the second slide, there is the Taylor shift. Um, it's not it's not significant as, as um, um, uh, uh, here because the complication it doesn't look like it's related to Taylor shift but uh, again we should consider as well um, 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 intervening as early as possible uh, so here um, the, ta uh, the, 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 the reduction um, uh, so we had 29 cases of satisfactory reduction um, um, that's the total number, and 10, 10 cases, um, uh, unfortunately, were not satisfactory. Um, uh, so, 
the 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 complicated is not is a complicated one. We had four cases, which forty percent um, of the total number uh, with non satisfactory reduction um, developed a post post a post of complication and and more specifically I'm mentioning here the infection uh, because it's it's one of the most common actually complications. Um, we had one case um, with a non satisfactory reduction, but um, uh, that was uh, infected, um, uh, but again, um, it seems that it, it is it is it is a, a significant um, um, a significant factor because uh, most of the time, unfortunately, um, when patient presented with with a dislocated um, um, ankle fracture, um, uh, they rec they need like two to three uh, two to three hours. Um, uh, until they've been seen and uh, reduced from the time of the injury until the um, presentation to the A and E. So, um, so this time, uh, within three hours, uh, uh, we found out that it looks like it 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 aim uh, or um, um, it carries a risk of having uh, an if, um, um, a complications after surgical fixation. And here we can see. The overall time or the reduction time, uh, um, uh, if 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 it took two to three hours, and the reduction time here, it doesn't mean uh, um, it doesn't mean that the re the actual reduction time, but the presentation from the time of injury to the um, uh, uh, to the A and E where the patients are being assessed, um, uh, they would take uh, two to three hours. When they take two to three hours, um, basically we had six patients that unfortunately develop a variety of complications. But that's why um, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the main points that we've discussed is in trying to reduce the reduction time by liaising with um, um, uh, with the uh, acute uh, uh, care or in the A &E department. Also in the in the first responder in emergency, uh, so we can reduce this time uh, in order to uh, uh, reduce or uh, decrease the number of complications because we found out uh, as um, if it if if it's taking two to three two to three hours that's uh, that's a bit much uh, and and whenever patients are having surgical fixations whether immediately um, after the uh, after the presentation, or they might be deferred for uh, three to four days if they develop any swelling. So it's uh, it's actually a matter of of hours before deciding whether whether we would take the patients for immediate surgical fixation, or whether we defer them for uh, two to three days until the swelling subsides. So, um, um, so we have to, in our in our uh, trust, we have two types of patients. Again, we, we sometimes we admit the patients, and sometimes we 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 if if the fracture is not significant, it's not associated with uh, with any dislocation, and it's a simple um, uh, unimalleolar or um, a bimalleolar fracture without with the stability, we can discharge the patients and they can see them. Uh, after three days, and they call TCI to be seen patients. Um, we found out actually that that the um, complications are higher uh, than um, in 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 the patients we admit immediately um, compared to the patients that we we uh, discharge and and we ask them we we admit them after three days, and and actually this is this is related to the. Um, um, this is related to the swelling uh, and the time of presentation and the severity of the fracture, uh, because most of the patients admitted, obviously they they have uh, uh, either a dislocation or uh, an unstable fracture, and they would require immediate intervention. Um, um, uh, so the, the, this is this is one one of the one of the points that we we're discussing. Uh, but again, it's uh, admission either admitting the patient or not uh, depends on 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 the top fracture or the uh, the patient's mobility 
and uh, and comorbidities as well. Um, uh, so uh, I personally um, think that this is this is uh, the, this fact is um, not modifiable that we can't we can't make a change about because uh, high risk patients obviously they would need to be admitted and unfortunately most most of the patients according to to our studies basically. Uh, they're associated with high risk of, of of complications and infection. So um, uh, the it, so the time the time from ED presentation, basically again from ED presentation to the assessment. Um, uh, so in one day, obviously one day, if if they present within one day, is associated with high risk of complications. Um, um, and we can see here, usually if they're presented on the fourth or the sixth day, um, 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 well, most of the cases were not complicated fracture and 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 usually the, the swelling subsides, it subsides and, and settles down and improves. So um, it would, would basically improve the outcome. Um, uh, but again, I wanna emphasize uh, the patients are presented immediately. Um, um, basically, uh, they're, they're associated with with more severity fracture like Weber B or Weber C, um, uh, with with a Taylor shift that would require uh, immediate admission uh, within uh, one to uh, twenty four hours. Um, so the the approach, the incision approach, again, it depends on uh, the location of the fracture. Um, um, and whether there is a syndesmotic injury or not. Um, uh, but we found out that the the lateral and the medial approach are associated with, with high risk of complications. We had uh, nine patients that have complication uh, compared to the other approaches. Um, um, uh, so that basically uh, is one of the points that we had to discuss um, and how to minimize the risk of, of complications intraoperatively apart from the NCG because um, there are there are um, most of the time the NCG type it depends on what is the fracture so we can choose basically uh, or a preference on the NCG approach um, uh, so if 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 the fracture type requires a lateral or a medial NCG Basically, we can take. Uh, we've decided to take extra uh, preventive steps um, um, and to be cautious about such patients in order to uh, reduce the number of um, complications. Okay. And here, one factor that we've decided to investigate is the whether to use the tourniquet. And whether the tourniquet, the pressure and the time is associated with um, with complications, and um, you uh, and here according to our data, uh, five patients with a tourniquet when we use a tourniquet, and the tourniquet pressure uh, is around three hundred. Five patients they developed complication, and usually the time if it's between eighty to ninety minutes, it's associated with higher. Um, complications compared to um, compared to less than eighty minutes, um, and and the question actually here is um, whether to use a tourniquet while fixing um, uh, an ankle fracture, um, um, and that's why um, we're investigating that factor independently, uh, whether the tourniquet and trial tourniquet. Uh, uh, usage is, is basically significant to developing uh, or to, to reduce or uh, to increase the post-op compl uh, post complications. Um, um, uh, but yeah, significantly, the, uh, when, when it is higher, when the tourniquet pressure is high, around 300 is high risk, uh, as, as we've seen, we had five patients who developed complication. So uh, the the comorbidities, which again, um, the uh, one of the um, things that we need to um, um, to discuss with the patient before uh, and after 
uh, any any kind of a plate or or, or a tightrope fixation. Um, uh, we have to educate the, our patients about uh, about whether they if they have risk factors, how we can control. So uh, uh, obviously, uh, smoking is associated uh, was associated with 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 the risk of complications. We had five patients that uh, developed complications who were actively smoker. Um, um, and also we have two patients um, that developed complication overall, two patients that um, also had an infection, a wound infection, deep infection. Um, so um, uh, the, the importance is always, um, I would say, is to discuss and 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 basically trying to manage the risk factors um in emergency cases we can't control that but after the fixation shitlaya is trying to um control um the blood sugar and and the diabetes also uh, trying to educate the patient about smoker providing a, a, an alternative and and um um, with the well, obviously with the smoker, say with delayed wound healing, the risk of infections are higher. The risk of complications are higher. So it's very important to um, um, uh, to discuss, it. and that's why we've implemented um, um, a program that um, uh, basically, if with any patients having any any sort of uh, plate fixation. Um, 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 we uh, we enroll them after they they are poor or if they are happy with their compliant to enroll them with a smoking cessation um, uh, program and to follow them up uh, later on um, uh, to see how they are responding. Uh, so, uh, in the conclusion, um, uh, uh, the the following points basically were observed. Uh, the infection rate is higher uh, than the expected, unfortunately, which is significant, and that's why uh, um, um, uh, we did this clinical audit, and it was 12.9% overall, um, and the acceptable rate was 3, three to 4%. Um, and uh, one of the risk factors is the delayed reduction time, which increased the uh, chances of complication. So uh, we're um, um, basically we've developed, um, uh, we had multiple meetings in order to reduce the reduction time. The reduction time means that from the time of presentation, um, once the patient is being assessed and on site uh, to being transported to the a &E, um, uh, this is also included in reduction time. Um, so we're trying to shorten the reduction time from two hours um, to less than one hour uh, from the time of injury until the patient is seen in the end. Um, and the um, complication rate in, in, in patients discharged home is lower. Again, we can't work on that, as, uh, as I've stated earlier, uh, because most of the patients admitted they require an emergency uh, because the fracture is unstable. Um, uh, and, we, when, and it's expected that the, the risk of complications are higher in admitted patients immediately on the same uh, on the same day of presentations compared to patients that we have discharged at home. Um, obviously, the dislocation is higher um, uh, associated with higher risk of complications. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the incision, um, uh, the model, or the type of incision basically it's associated with uh, high risk of complications, the lateral and the medial approach. So, um, um, uh, uh, so it's um, uh, the, uh, the, on this point, we've worked out to take an extra precaution step, um, um, whether um, uh, it's either to admit the patient immediately and do the operation uh, within the same admission um, and to take an extra step intraoperatively where we give the patients um, um, uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics um, in order to reduce the risk of infection. Um, so uh, the complications obviously is higher uh, by a trimalular fracture and um, a smoker and um, and diabetic associated with higher risk of complications as, as I've said. Um, uh, so uh, uh, our program is 
um, to focus on such patients in order to optimize their their risk factors. For example, if they're smokers trying to um, or trying to avoid smoking cessation, providing um, providing them with an alternative um, 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 nicotine uh, supplements, and also involving a diabetic nurse in order to educate the patients about uh, the devastating um, um, uh, nature of of um, of having a failure uh, that ultimately might require uh, the metal removal. Um, uh, so it's very important for the patients actually to be aware because uh, I've noticed that most of our patients they're not aware that diabetes might be might be might be related. Smoking might be related, um, um, if if um, and also wound care. Some some unfortunately some patients they uh, they don't they don't basically do the proper follow up. So all of these uh, should be discussed with the patients even before they are being discharged or or in the uh, outpatient follow up um, in order to optimize their outcome. So our recommendation again is to ensure the adequate reduction time, um, uh, and uh, the other th the other thing is that should we stop using a tourniquet, where we're still investigating that whether to use or not, uh, uh, not to use on a tourniquet and drop in in an ankle fracture, especially with dislocated ones, um, because they're associated with high risk of complications. Um, also, this, as as said, um, uh, do we need a minimally invasive options? We can we can uh, basically discuss that option with the patient rather than um, uh, doing a minimally invasive rather than um, uh, um, a major operation because if they are smokers. Um, um, but again, one of the things is to uh, to ensure that the patient understands that smokers is a risk factor. Uh, also, um, as was I've discussed, the management, uh, uh, man management plan and uh, the risk factors, um, uh, for at least again two months or probably more, uh, in order to reduce such complications. Uh, thank you for very much for for listening and, um. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamza. It was a nice presentation. Are there any queries? Um, and in the hand or in the upper limb, uh, occur mostly due to fractures because um you know there was a study a retrospective study in 2018 uh found that around 42 percent of uh, crps type 1 happened after fractures um around 20 percent happened after blunt traumas like sprains and um, bruises while uh, uh, surgeries constituted around 12 uh, percent of the total incidents, and lastly, carpal tunnel syndrome consumed about seven percent. So I'm going to talk about CRPS type one, but uh, there are ty two types with the same clinical picture uh, and uh, same signs and symptoms. Um, uh, but the difference um, lies in the cause of the CRPS. You know, type one uh, usually there is no nerve injury, uh, while type two. Uh, occurs um, typically after nerve injury. So we can, we can say that type 1 is an OC septive in origin and type 2 is neuropathic. Uh, because we are involved here with type 1, which is uh, in which there is no nerve injury, um, I wanted to just uh, pass uh, very quickly on um, an example. Uh, so uh, this appearance here is very characteristic. Uh, I've seen I've seen it very, uh, many many times. Um, the mottling appearance of the hand. Uh, usually when I see it, I immediately doubt that their pa this patient is going to uh, be a CRPS uh, case. Uh, so um, uh, I wanted to highlight the mottling appearance in particular. Um, 
in addition to uh, the hand is a little bit swollen so there is a uh, there is a uh, uh, edema of the hand and distal tapering of uh, the fin fingers on the dorsum of the hand there is absent uh, distal creases like we see here and the uh, and the uh, nail changes and brittling of the nails um so uh, this is a typical appearance of uh, crps i wanted to highlight it um another uh, example um so as a physician, you need also to be a judge uh, to uh, to judge um, where, which patient is likely going to have CRPS because, you know, CRPS is not fully understood. The pathogen is not yet to be uh, to be all discovered and uh, uh, there is no golden standard diagnostic criteria. So the best option here is to prevent it from happening in the first place uh, to avoid the the functional and motor impairment. So, like I said, there's no golden standard diagnostic criteria. However, there have been many trials. The first of them was in 1994 uh, with the Orlando criteria. This Orlando criteria was um, used to, uh, in many uh, research and validation studies until they reached the most accepted nowadays uh, with the best criteria. The Buddha, this is uh, the Budapest criteria, the highlight of the criteria, the chronic pain, of course, and um, this pain uh, is uh, unproportionate with the, uh, the with the cause. Um, the next uh, uh, categories of the criteria are um, are are you can see them by history and by examination so the patient tells you and you find them uh, if you found three out of four categories by history and by examination uh, along with the pain and no other explaining condition you got yourself a case of crps so these four categories are the sensory uh, vasomot zoodomotor and uh, motor trophic changes uh, the sensory ch changes are, uh, are either the hyperthesia or allodynia uh, and uh, by examination you can see you can see that uh, you can see them by the pen prick test in the uh, light touch um uh, the vasomotor changes uh, like the um, uh, skin changes and um Temperature abnormalities. Uh, we, with examining them, uh, you can see that there is one um, more than one uh, degree Celsius uh, uh, difference between the healthy hand and the affected hand. Uh, there are uh, zoodomotor changes. Uh, the third category is uh, where there is edema, sweating, um, occurrence. Uh, this uh, is either reported by the patient or you can examine it yourself. Last changes is, is affection, motor affection. There's weakness, decreased um, range of motion, hair, nail changes, either by history reported by the patient or by examination. Uh, so we need to keep this in mind in order to be aware um, uh, that this uh, can happen after surgery. This um, uh, should be caught early to avoid uh, misunfortunate um, consequences. So this is our main uh, topic here today, is the prevention of CRPS type 1 after in surgeries. Uh, so um, you have first to keep in mind that it's not that rare to have it uh, after surgery as uh, the point is uh, it is not uh, um it is not uh, widely noticed and is not um, uh, uh reported uh, that's what uh, sometimes uh, that's why sometimes we don't keep it in mind however uh, there have been some effort in uh, doing um, studies that um, that reached uh, effective uh, pharmacological agents uh, that um, prevented the occurrence uh, of uh, CRPS after surgery. There uh, were another effort uh, that could not reach the same, um, the same result uh, with uh, some pharmacological agents like calcitonin, manitol, corticosteroids, carnitines, and ketensterines. Uh, these uh, 
these were all considered but uh, not yet uh, to be effective by uh, by um, by a proof however vitamin c was the only um, pharmacological agents that has been proven to prevent the occurrence of uh, uh, crps type 1 uh, i'm also uh, uh, going to talk about the importance of applying uh, early programs of rehabilitation in addition to uh, considering prevention with vitamin C. So um, I need to highlight uh, the um, importance of vitamin C because, it, like I said, it was the only proven drug to have um, been, uh, uh, that have been effective to uh, prevent CRPS type 1 after surgeries. And uh, uh, I need to highlight also the importance of the dose here. So the uh, and a very old uh, study or an old, not very old, uh, was done in the first decade of uh, this uh, century. Uh, this study concluded that uh, 500 to 1,000 milligrams uh, uh, of uh, vitamin C for, for 50 days showed uh, efficacy after uh, wrist uh, fracture and limb uh, double limb surgery. This study was done on 1,000 patients uh, uh, nearly. So another study was done two years um, ago. This study found that uh, uh, regardless of the dose, on a follow-up for 12 months, uh, uh, vitamin C showed a good efficacy on um, preventing CRPS type 1 after the surgery in, in comparison to the control group. So the dose here ranged from anywhere from 200 to uh, 1500 milligrams uh, per day. However, the same study tried to focus on the high dose and they found that um, uh, that taking or giving uh, 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 more than uh, 500 milligrams uh, vitamin C uh, daily uh, for patients uh, on a follow-up found it very uh, highly effective uh, compared to patients who did not uh, have the same uh, as the same drug. So, another systemic review in 2022 um, uh, found that uh, giving perioperative vitamin C um, was uh, very effective in preventing um, TRPS type 1. Uh, uh, despite uh, stratification according to the fracture site, so we don't really have an issue here uh, with the site of the fracture. It is effective regardless. This year, there was an, an interesting study that uh, um, that uh, uh, where they have uh, given vitamin C IV with a very high dose. When I mean very high dose, I mean it's um, over 10, uh, 12 uh, grams per day. So they have given it IV. After the surgery, um, uh, every eight hours you give uh, um, five grams, so fifteen grams totally a day. Uh, this uh, study found that uh, it was very effective with mild, uh, um, mild side effects. It was very effective in not only uh, did it um, uh, reduce or um, uh, prevented the occurrence of CRPS type one after the surgery. It also had a very good anti-inflammatory effect and um, decreased uh, the pain after the surgery with a better, uh, better uh, functional outcomes and um, better, uh, uh, better overall re results. So uh, it showed that uh, they had uh, very good uh, results in all aspects, uh, not only the prevention of CRPS with minimal side effects. Uh, so this uh, is um, all about uh, the vitamin C, uh, but uh, we can do um, another um, another considerations uh, and keep them in mind, like you know, restarting a rehabilitation program as soon as the surgery ends um, uh, is uh, mandatory um, because in, generally in, ha in hand surgery, you need to start the early program uh, very, uh, very soon, like the second day of surgery. Uh, this uh, helps uh, reducing the um, or reversing the uh, spinal cord and brain uh, 
impulses or uh, changes that is associated with chronic pain. So uh, um, consequently, it will lead to a decrease of pain, which is the opposite of CRPS, of course. Um, so uh, I need to, to address one last thing before I go. There are efforts um, on uh, uh, CRPS generally and CRPS type one. Um, however, uh, the the uh, the proven uh, the proven methods by uh, clinical studies are not uh, that much. Uh, so these are some efforts that uh, maybe they will be proven in the future. We can we can consider them if we are looking research areas. So there was a pilot study uh, done uh, uh, early in the last uh, decade. Uh, this uh, study aimed to understand more about the pathogenesis of uh, CRPS or complex gene pain syndrome. This study suggested and uh, and reached positive results regarding the uh, the role of omega-6 and trans fatty acids in the development of CRPS. Uh, so they found, yes, uh, that uh, omega-6 and trans fatty acids can play uh, a role in uh, CRPS occurrence. And the last of this study last year, another study was done uh, on the role of a prevention by omega-3 uh, supplementation. So uh, they tried why, uh, so okay, they, they said, okay, well, this study said the omega-6 might have a role, so why not we try the omega-3 to, uh, to prevent the occurrence of CRPS type 1. However, the study was done on a mouse model of uh, CRPS uh, 1, and it showed, yes, it showed the positive results. It shows it has anti hyperalgesic effects uh, and uh, reduced pain in the mouse model. Uh, it reduced both the infl uh, inflammatory, clinic inflammatory, and acute inflammatory uh, phases of CRPS uh, type 1 model. And it also uh, said that the omega three had uh, another uh, another um, another uh, good benefits be be beyond the CRPS, which is uh, which is effect on the inflammation in general, and other it might work in other neuropathic conditions other than the CRPS. Um, so uh, this is an area of research. Another area of research should be about the earlier drugs that I mentioned that can be useful and some of them was actually used in the treatment of uh, CRPS after it has occurred. But we are talking about the prevention here. So these drugs can be uh, very uh, effective. However, we don't have a proof yet. So these uh, are area uh, of research on uh, drugs like calcitonin, corticosteroids, mannitol, carnitine, ketone, three. Um, uh, that's all for today. Uh, these are the references, and um, this is my email. If anyone wanted to, to ask about anything or wanted to um, share in a research idea, uh, okay. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so much, Doctor Sara. Your presentation was outstanding. which is uh, uh, in the in the green dot uh, here and uh, formerly I was uh, part of the department in here in Skalica so we had uh, one case here in Skalica uh, which I will talk about today so uh, a little bit statistic so glenohomeral joint is the most regularly dislocated joint in the body uh, the most uh, dislocated joint. Concomitant fracture of tuberculum myus is present in approximately 20% of all anterior dislocation. Uh, the incident rate of process of coracoideus in scapular fracture range from 3 to 14, uh, 13%. Until now, there are only 22 cases described fracture of process of coracoideus and uh, with concomitant anterior joint dislocation. The anterior shoulder dislocation with concomitant processes, coracoidus fracture, and tuberculum myosomery is extremely rare. 
only three cases or three patients, uh, three cases mentioned in uh, literature in two patients, one of them with bilateral presentation uh, of the case. So uh, the case report itself, uh, three years ago the, in the orthopedic department in Slovakia, 25 year old patient after epileptic seizure, left shoulder pain, unable to move the shoulder. The X-ray diagnosis revealed the anterior glulenohumeral joint dislocation, tubercle mice humeri fracture near four or after uh, after four three, uh, process of coracoidus scapula fracture OGAVA two or IRS uh, grade two, without any other injuries. So we uh, we did the reposition using the far Fares maneuver in local anesthesia, and then we do the control X-ray uh, where the dislocation still there, and also uh, the CT scan where dislocation of proximal coracoideus more than one centimeter uh, was still presented, and also the dislocation in tuberculum myus uh, with more than half of centimeter was still presented. So finding was indicated uh, for surgical fixation of the bone fragments. So we did the, the fixation with uh, uh, two three millimeter screw on and two uh, 3.5 millimeter screw. Post surgery, your face bandage, uh, post operative period without complication. Also, antibiotics, analgetics uh, according to uh, WHO protocols, uh, 10 days post surgery, stitches extraction, pendulum exercises allowed with continued fixation, and shoulder fixation discontinued after six weeks post surgery, maximum movement with maximum movement exercises. Uh, so, post operative physiotherapy, uh, physiotherapy was individual no spa treatment, uh, full range of movement and weight bearing up to one year post surgery. Uh, the constant score was 95 points. Relative constant score was uh, nine, uh, 97%. Uh, dash score is zero, wash score is zero. So, visual analog scale. So, the uh, the result was was pretty, pretty good. Uh, this is the perioperative. X-ray, and uh, on the right side down, they are after one year post-surgery. So this is a functional outcome of the patient. Uh, so literature overview. So far, only two patients were presented in literature. First, in 1994, uh, in the left shoulder post-epileptic seizure, and. Uh, uh, in the beginning of the millennium in France due to fall, uh, due to hypoglycemia, and uh, that was the bilateral uh, case. So due to the lack of case studies, there is no specific treatment algorithm. Uh, generally accepted way of treatment is modified according to isolated injuries of all anatomic parts, with taking at most account the stability of glenohumeral joint. So, for example, for fragment of process of coracoideus, uh, the accepted way of treatment is uh, better with operation when there is a dislocation wider than one centimeter, and in the fragments of tuberculum myos, uh, is better to treat it with operation in dislocation wider than four or five millimeters. So, uh, the mechanism process of the mechanism of this injury is still controversial, and there are two main opinions presented. The first is the possible mechanism of fractured traction force of the attached muscle, or the horizontal sharing force acting between the scapula and the clavicle, combined with the concomitant ligament coracoclavicular rupture. And the second is the possible mechanism of the fracture might be the direct force affecting the process of coracoideus. So uh, there are the mechanism of tuberculum myosomery based on the much 
classification. Uh, when uh, the first is when extra rotation of the humerus is striking, head is crushing to the glenoid, so energy of the impact is high. Or the second is when uh, the extra rotation is inadequate due to the mass of contraction, so energy is low. So, uh, conclusion. The anterior short dislocation with concomitant process for a previous fracture is extremely rare. Our case report is the third one describing the patient with the specific injury. And the management of this specific injury takes into account management of the isolated injuries combined in this case. And also we have opinion on the mechanism of origin this type of injury. It is presented in a very specific environment like epileptic seizures or hypoglycemic seizures associated with uh, severe muscle contraction. So first, the contraction, uh, so first is the contraction of uh, musculus infraspinatus, which extrarotate the glenohumeral joint. Then second, the concomitant contraction of uh, musculus pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi dislocate the humeral head, and the contraction of the rotator cuff ma uh, makes it in intractable, so uh, the locus minoris, or the, the place of the, of the, of the uh, fracture is tuberculum myris. Process of coracoidus fracture is caused by pulling and contraction of musculus biceps brachii, and its origin is dependent from the tuberculosis myos fracture. So thank you for your time, and thank you for uh, to present me my my case report. Thank you so much, Doctor. I believe participants gained insights from your research work. Thank you so much. Rakaya Alhabsi, and I'm going to present a retrospective study of the post-operative infections following open tibia fractures. This is an evaluation of incidence and prognostic factors. First, I'd like to start with the definitions. We've got open fractures, which are bony injuries in which the fracture hematoma or the fractured bone are communicating with the external environment because of a traumatic disruption in the continuity of soft tissues and skin. The second definition that we are looking at is fracture-related infections. These are open tibia fracture complications and about 65% of them occur in the tibia. In December 2016, a consensus meeting was hosted by AO Foundation and was held in Switzerland. It had a group of experts from various organizations, such as the European Bone and Joint Infection Society. They discussed the definition of fracture-related infections, signs and symptoms, and their multidisciplinary management options. They grouped the criteria to diagnose fracture-related infections into confirmatory criteria and suggestive criteria. The confirmatory criteria uh, included the formation of fistulas, sinuses, and evidence of wound breakdown, as well as purulent discharge with the presence of pus. The suggestive criteria included clinical signs such as erythema, pyrexia, elevation in inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and white cell count. The gastillo anderson classification has type 1, 2, 3A, 3B, and 3C, in which type 1 is a fracture with the presence of a skin wound that is less than 1 cm long, it's usually a low energy mechanism and does not have any gross contaminants. Type 2, there is a fracture and the skin wound is between 1 to 10 centimeters long. It's a low energy mechanism and usually does not have any gross contaminants or extensive soft tissue injury. It doesn't have any avulsions and does not require a flap for coverage. Type 3A is a fracture with a skin wound larger than 10 centimeters, yet it still has adequate coverage of the soft tissue. 
or any open fracture that occurred due to a high energy mechanism or any open fracture that occurred due to a high energy mechanism or related to gross contamination from the external environment irrespective of wound size. Type 3B is a significant injury or loss of soft tissue with periosteal stripping, bone exposed to the external environment, and it requires covering with transfer of muscle or a rotational flap. And finally, we have type 3C, which is a significant soft tissue injury associated with the fracture. It's a high level energy trauma and is associated with vascular injury, which will need repair. In 2022, SUP and SUP published a 15 year analysis in the United Kingdom, which evaluated open fracture epidemiology in skeletally mature individuals. It showed an incidence of 30.7 per 100,000 persons annually. It showed that the commonest causes of injury were crush injuries and road traffic accidents. Crush injuries gave a total of 39.5% of open lower limb fractures per year, and road traffic accidents had a, an incidence of 37.1%. The Gustilo Anderson classification system is one of the predictors of severity of infection, and usually the risk of infection is less than 1% in type 1 and about 30% in type 3. The overall objective of this study was to determine the incidence of fracture-related infections post-open fractures of the tibia and to compare initial management done to ascertain if specific risk factors or steps in management affected this. This was a retrospective single NHS trust study that aimed to measure the incidence of infections post-open tibia fractures to evaluate the trust's adherence to both guidelines and to determine if an increased infection incidence rate is associated with factors such as delays in definitive management or early initial management. The primary outcome was to evaluate whether the timely administration of antibiotics affected the incidence of infections in open tibia fractures. Coming to the methodology of the study, the study was a retrospective analysis of data in a single major trauma service trust in the United Kingdom. As for the participants and sampling process, the sampling was done using the trauma and orthopedic department's multidisciplinary MDT patient discussion list and the hospital's electronic patient record or EPR system. As for the study criteria, we had the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria were all patients who were adults aged from 18 years old and older. Both male and female patients were included. And the inclusion period was a five year period between 1st of January 2017 to 31st of December 2022. All of the patients had to be discussed in the trauma and orthopedics MDT meeting, which occurs on, on a daily basis. As for the exclusion criteria, all patients in the pediatric age group, ages less than 18 years old, were excluded. Any patients with open fractures other than an open tibia fracture were excluded. All lower limb trauma calls, which resulted in traumatic unplanned limb amputations, and all patients who were managed conservatively as their definitive management. Initially, data was collected using the Trauma and Orthopedic Department's MDT Handover Excel sheet, which contained all patients discussed in the meeting within the inclusion period. Ward search was done using the following keywords, open, tibia, tip, leg, and lower limb. Further confirmation of data was done by checking the hospital's report generator, which contains theater database for all patients operated on within the inclusion period. The trust's clinical record system, known as power chart, was used to access information about the patient's time, date, 
mechanism of injury, as well as time of antibiotic administration, time to theater, and operative notes. PowerChart allowed access from initial documentation done in the emergency department to discharge and clinic follow-up documentations. All data was collected using an Excel spreadsheet table and data relevant to the study was recorded. The data was collected in sections from A to K as follows. A was the number. These were patient identifiers initially collected in the hospital's secure system and erased once the data has been collected to ensure patient confidentiality has been maintained. B was exclusion. Patients were excluded from the study for reasons such as age group and transfer from other hospitals where initial management took place. C were patient demographics, including age, gender, and ethnicity. D included dates and times. This was the date and time of injury, time of arrival to the emergency department, and date of discharge, as well as length of stay in the hospital. E was antibiotic administration. This basically questioned whether antibiotics were administered within three hours of injury and the type of antibiotic used and if any doses were missed. F was the trauma call data. This is data that was collected, including the mechanism of injury, whether low energy or high energy, presence of any gross contaminants and neurovascular injury, which prompted urgent transfer to theater. G was admission assessment. This included time to splinting, type of dressing used, and whether a clinical photograph was taken prior to initial debridement. As for H, this was information about the operative procedure. It included time to initial debridement from injury, ASA or American Society of Anesthesiology score, type of fixation used, whether it was an intramedullary nail or an external fixator, the seniority of the surgeon, presence of plastics in theater of soft, presence of plastics in theater for soft tissue management, and the use of Bose Performa for open fractures, as well as time to definitive fixation if an external fixator was used initially. Section I included information about the definitive plastics procedure performed, including time of procedure since the injury, type of closure done, and the surgeon seniority, whether this included the presence of a registrar, a fellow, or a consultant. Section J contained information about complications and outcomes. This included incidents of infections, whether they're deep, superficial, and pin site infections, types of microorganisms isolated by culture, infection resulted in delayed amputation or removal of metalwork. And finally, we have section K, which is the past medical history section. It included comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, COPD, smoking, to evaluate whether there is any increased risk of such infections. From A to K, data was scored with a zero if the answer was no, and scored with a one if the answer was a yes. This was later used to count the total numbers and was applied to all patients who fit the inclusion criteria. A request was submitted for ethical approval to the quality improvement projects of the trust prior to the commencement of the study. All patient identifiers were discarded and confidentiality was maintained. From the five-year retrospective evaluation, a total of 440 patients were brought to the emergency department, trauma called and discussed in the trauma and orthopedics MDT meeting. 100 patients were excluded for not meeting the inclusion criteria. The reason for this was that 58 patients were transferred from other trusts where they received initial management and 42 were in the pediatric age group. A total of 340 patients in the five-year period met the inclusion criteria and were further analyzed. The following table shows the results of the patient demographics. 
the total number of patients who met the inclusion criteria was 340. About 9.7% of patients, 33 out of 340, developed an open tibia fracture-related infection. The average age of those patients was 45 years old and ranged between 21 years and 85 years. Males had a higher incidence of infection, 81.8%, which was 27 out of 33, in comparison to females who had an incidence of 18.2%, 6 females out of 33 patients. The second table shows the administration of antibiotics data. 96.97% of patients received antibiotics in a timely manner, within three hours of injury. However, 15.2%, 5 out of 33 of them, had a missed dose of antibiotics in the wards, which can be seen in Table 2. The following table shows the scoring of the patient's Gustillo and Anderson classification. Initial debridement allowed classification using Gustillo Anderson system classification, which can be seen in the following table. Two patients had type 1 Gustillo Anderson classification, nine patients had type 3B, 13 patients did not have any documentation of the classification system in their operative notes or theater documentation. Of the 33 patients, 22 were managed using an external fixator, and 11 patients had an intramedullary nail placed. 13 patients out of 33 were closed primarily, and 4 patients had a negative pressure dressing, known as a vacuum-assisted closure, VAC closure. 8 patients had a split skin graft, and 5 patients were managed with a free flap. Nine patients out of 33 had a superficial infection, and 13 of them had a deep infection. The patients who had a deep infection were further analyzed about the outcome, and 17% of them had a non-union of their fracture, 25% had a delayed amputation, and 58% ended up having a second procedure for removal of metalwork. Now, to discuss the results, and the study. So this was a retrospective five-year single trust analysis and was carried out with an aim to determine the incidence of fracture-related infections post-open tibia fractures and to ascertain whether this incidence was increased by factors such as timely antibiotic administration, time to initial management, Gastillo-Anderson classification post-debridement, patient comorbidities, and the type of definitive skeletal management and soft tissue cover. The data was analyzed and plotted on an Excel spreadsheet using sections such as patient demographics, antibiotic administration, trauma call data, operative procedure, complications and outcomes, as well as patient comorbidities. Incidence of the open tibia fractures in the five-year period was higher in males than females, which may contribute to the higher incidence of infection in males. The majority of patients received their antibiotics within a three-hour period from injury. This was a 96.97% of patients. However, five patients had missed antibiotic doses. From the patient documentation, it was concluded that there were three main reasons for this. It was either that patients were not at their bedside for prolonged periods of time, causing them to miss their antibiotics. Non-compliant patients, such as patients who refuse cannulas or refuse to receive their doses, or in case of tissueing of a cannula or removal of a cannula, there is delays in recannulation. post debridement castillo anderson classification showed variation in the incidence of infection. The higher the classification type, the higher the incidence. Castillo type 1 had only 2 patients out of 33, whereas type 3B had 9 patients affected. 
Unfortunately, documentation of the classification was not always carried out, and 13 patients with an infection did not have their Gastillo Anderson classification documented. In some instances, these patients were primarily closed. Therefore, it can be said that they likely had a lower Gastilla Anderson classification, such as a type 1 or type 2 classification. Management of the fracture with an external fixator showed a higher incidence of infection, about 59.06% of patients, than fixation with an intramedullary nail. Patients with an external fixator were routinely instructed on how to adequately carry out pin site care at home prior to their discharge. However, adherence to this is limited and is reflected in a higher incidence of pin site infections. Adhering to the open fracture operation performa, showed a reduced incidence of infection. Clinicians using the Performa were more meticulous in their documentation and it resulted in better adherence to both guidelines. Not using the Performa resulted in inconsistencies in documentation. Undocumented data such as, or most commonly the Gustillo Anderson classification, the time of initial debridement from injury, and whether pre-debridement or post-debridement clinical photography was done. As for the limitations of the study, um, it mainly comes down to the inclusion period. It is a five-year inclusion period from 2017 to 2022. This period was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic as there was a national lockdown and additional protective measures, which may have resulted in delays to the arrival to the emergency department, delays to initial debridement and definitive management all of which could have contributed to an increased rate of infection during this period. In conclusion, open fractures of the tibia are the most common fractures of long bones. Fracture-related infections are one of the most common post-operative complications and vary in severity. And confirmatory as well as suggestive criteria have been published to aid with its diagnosis. Adherence to both guidelines is a significant step in prevention of fracture-related infections. Early, m early administration of antibiotics combined with no missed doses, intramedullary nailing and primary skin closure as the definitive management showed the lowest rates of infection. External fixators showed a high rate of pin site infections and split skin grafts were the most commonly infected. The recommendation suggested by the study was that adherence to the both guidelines when managing open fractures and ensuring patients are adequately assessed and management is well documented can be done by ensuring that all members of the trauma and orthopedics department are aware of the performa that can be used. This will ensure consistency in the quality of management of patients and adequate documentation. This was a single NHS trust study, therefore data is limited to local trust guidelines. A wider multi-center study would show a bigger picture and a better determination of the incidence of fracture-related infections. The following are the references used for this study. Thank you very much for listening to the presentation. My name is Alina Wancha and I am UNT consultant at Colza Clinical Hospital, Bucharest, Romania. Today I will discuss about branchial kist and I will show you some case presentations from our hospital. I decided to discuss about uh, these cases because in our clinic we met a few cases that can create difficulties in diagnosis, but also because of the age of our patients. 41 and 45. The branchial kist is a rare congenital malformation caused by an abnormality of embryonic development of the cervical region. 
Usually, branchial kist have the origin from second branchial arch. Most of the time, it is unilateral, anterior of the sternocleidomastoidian muscles, and appear in the first two decades of life. The embryogenesis of branchial kist is a complex process and essential for the proper development of head and neck structures. The branchial arches are temporary mass that appear between the second and seventh week of intrauterine development. There are six arches delimited by internal or endodermal pouch and external or ectodermal pouches. The fifth arch is rudimentary, disappearing soon after formation. Each branchial arch contains a core called mesoderm, an inner covering called endoderm, and an outer covering called ectoderm. We also see muscle, cartilage, nerve, and aortic arch. The main function is the morphogenetic functions, meaning to create structures, face, neck, nasal cavity, tongue, larynx, external and middle ear, some endocrine glands like thyroid, parathyroid, or thymus. Of course, each branchial arch contributes to the development of muscle, bones, nerve, and arteries. By today, I decided to discuss strictly about the second branchial arch because this is where most branchial kists originate. Second branchial arch, or hyoid arch, appears during the fourth week of intrauterine development. In the structure of the second pharyngeal arch is Reichert's cartilage, from which it will develop the upper half and the small horn of the hyoid bone, the stylohyoid ligament, the styloid process of the temporal bone, the steps. The muscles that develop from this arch are stylohyoid muscles, posterior belly of the digastric muscles, platysma muscles, auricular muscle, stapedius muscle, the occitofrontalis, and the fascial muscles. The nerve is the fascial nerve, and from the aortic heart develops stapedial artery and hyoid artery. The certain diagnosis of branchial kist is given by the histopathological examination. We also can help by clinical examination, where we can see a lateral cervical round tumor mass with fluctuating consistency, which can may increase in size and become painful, can give uh, breathing difficulties, dysphagia, and dysphonia. The imagistic exam can confirm and assess size and location of the tumoral mass. From the cervical ultrasound, where we will see the kistic character, MRI show a hypodense mass well circumscribed. But don't forget that only the biopsy confirmed the diagnosis. The only treatment of the branchial kist is surgical, and to prevent recurrence is necessary complete excision of the kist. Now, I will present the first case, which is a female without significant personal pathological antecedents. She was admitted in our clinic for chronic nasal obstruction and the left lateral cervical mass, which appeared approximately four months ago, with progressive evolution. At the ENT clinical examination, we can observe a left lateral cervical tumor mass of 5 per 5 centimeter, well the limit is with soft consistency, mobile on the deep and superficial planes, painless without changing in the surrounding skin. At the fibroscopic examination, unfortunately, we saw um, tumor mass in nasopharynx. The first step was to do biopsy from the nasopharynx, from the tumor in the nasopharynx uh, under local anesthesia and fibroscopic control, and send it to the histopathological examination. Here was the moment of difficulty because of the patient age, 14 plus, and uh, we know the branchial kist appear in the first two decades of life. The presence of this tumor, mass of the level of the rhinopharynx, make us to take in consideration the differential diagnosis with kistic metastasis. The CT scan shows us a kistic appearing left lateral cervical tumor mass with dimension of 5 per 5 cm, 
well-defined, relatively homogeneous, peripherally iodophilic, developed anteriorly by the sternocleidomastoidian muscles and posteriorly by the left submandibular gland, which imprint the vascular bundle of the left inside. Also, you show us a nodular hypertrophy of the posterior wall of the nasopharynx. Meantime, the result of the histopathological examination of the narrow-firing tumor was ready. The result was appearance of chronic pharyngitis. Under general anesthesia and orotracheal intubation, we practiced the ablation of the left lateral cervical tumor mass, which was sent to the histopathological examination. The post-surgical evolution was favorable, the suction drain tube was suppressed on the second day, and the patient was discharged on the third day. The diagnosis of branchial kist was confirmed by histopathological result. The second case, this time, is a male without significant personal pathological antecedents. He was admitted in our clinic for right lateral cervical mass, which appeared approximately two months ago with progressive evolution. At the ENT clinical examination, we saw a um, left lateral cervical tumor mass at 5 cm, well delimited with soft consistency, mobile on the deep and superficial planes, painless, without changing in the surrounding skin. The fibroscopic examination was normal. The CT scan show us a kistic appearing right lateral cervical tumor mass with dimension of 8 per 5 cm, well defined, relatively homogeneous, peripherally iodophilic, developed anteriorly by the sternocleidomastoidin man muscles, which imprint the vascular bundle on the right side. Under general anesthesia, we practice the ablation of the right lateral cervical tumor mass and send it to the histopathological exam. The post-surgical evolution was favorable. The suction drain tube was suppressed on the second day. A patient was discharged on the third day. The diagnosis of branchial kist was confirmed by histopathological results. The differential diagnosis of branchial kist can be parotid tumor, tumor of the submandibular gland, vascular tumors, adenopathy of various cases, superficial tumors, hydatic kist, uh, cervical metastatic adenopathies, and adenopathies from lymphomas. In conclusion, we can say that branchial kists are rare congenital malformation that can be present both at the time of birth and during life, appear due to abnormality of embryonic development with incomplete involution of the branchial arch. Represent a pathological cavity with liquid or semi-solid content delimited by an epithelial membrane, which tends to increase in size. Are rare conditions, as I said, but must be included in the differential diagnosis of all conditions that may appear at the lateral cervical level. The problem is that the majority of branchial kists appearing in people over 40 years of age turn out to be kistic metastasis. The early diagnosis is essential because it tends to increase in volume and superinfection, preventing complication. And don't forget that the only appropriate treatment is surgical ablation of the kist and the histopathological exam confirm the diagnosis. Saudi Arabia. We would like to present um, one case report of variant of right-headed heartbeat during laparoscopic hysterectomy. 
Uh, it was published in, in Medical, Medical Science in, on, uh, on uh, December uh, 10, uh, 2022. Uh, regarding introduction of this variant, uh, it's usually uh, torture was pattern with the right with attributing an image associated with uh, something called caterpillar, uh, which is run proximal to the parallel to the cystic tract under the uh, it's associated usually with the short cystic artery and the high risk of vascular injury during the most serious uh, scenario. On this image, we we'll describe the normal anatomy which is the right hepatic, usually with the long cystic artery. Uh, on this caterpillar variation of the cystic artery and right hepatic, the right hepatic itself is tortuous and pink like U shape to the, to the liver, which can be mistaken as cystic artery. Uh, so this is the normal, the normal anatomy, but can be also with this kind of variation. And our, our case was a young female, 24 year old female, sent to the clinic with normal, with normal uh, presentation of the clinical cases. Uh, she was complaining of right hand pain, and we did for her ultrasound that shows stones and normal uh, caliber of the chrome bile duct. Love wise, she was then normal, so admitted to the surgery, to the surgery unit. For uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, intraoperative was done smoothly, and uh, on the dissection and clarification of the color triangle, we found there is wide structure uh, going to the gallbladder, but it's like a U shape, which is pink. So we raised our suspicion regarding this kind of anomaly, which is an anatomical variant because of. Uh, respond to the right capability, which is as, as a loop in the form of caterpillar inside the current triangles. So, uh, the ideal way is to do uh, ligation through the tools close to the gallbladder, avoiding uh, uh, for any injury to the right capability. So, this is the the picture of the variation. So if you see this artery, it's doing like U shape and can be mistaken as a cystic artery. So, um, and we'll do uh, some uh, serious condition and serious circumstances for the patient. So the ideal way to have in your mind this kind of variation and to ligate just the branches to the gallbladder itself. So once you dissect, you try to go up to make sure the artery is going to the to the gallbladder itself, and it's not kinky like in this case. Uh, discussion surgeons have been very interested in the anatomy of the really triangle to perform say surgical procedure. Uh, anatomical variation, especially in the in the really triangle, triangle and anatomy for the duct and arteries. It's around 20 to 50 percent of the patient. So uh, you should raise your suspicion for any anomaly. The incident of uh, caterpillar uh, hung, it's, which is the aberrant of right hepatic artery, it's around 1.3 to 13, according to the literature. The etiology is not clear, but there is some, some hypothesis. Uh, the first one regarding the, uh, the um, Torsuity of the artery, which is contributed with the architectural distortion of the intrahepatic branch, intrahepatic artery in patients with cirrhosis. Uh, another hypothesis is explained based on the Beruni uh, development of the hepatobiliary system. In our case, uh, with the short cystic artery arising uh, from uh, complexity because of the proximity of the load to the gold and the right hepatic artery may be confused with the cystic artery and ligated. In case uh, injured or ligated the right hepatic artery, there is several uh, sequences can happen. First one is if, if completed ligated the right hepatic can develop in some ischemic necrosis of the right loop of the liver. The other one, the second one, if 
partially injured and uh, cause uh, hepatic artery pseudo aneurysm uh, and can cause uh, fatal bleeding. Uh, and uh, the third one is the vascular injury during the surgery or during the laparoscopy itself can do a lot of bleeding and uh, the vision will be not clear for the surgery. On conclusion, uh, knowing the anatomy and um, putting in your mind the variation of the, the hepatobiliary system regarding the duct itself and artery is almost on the key point in this presentation. Uh, so uh, to put in your mind, there is a way for of the material anomaly. Uh, consent and physical clearance, conflict of interest and funding was verified to the uh, journal. And this is my consent. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much.